for our call to worship. Brothers and sisters, we are loved by God. We have turned from idols. As we worship and pray together, the one who calls us is faithful. He will lead us, guide us, and give us strength. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, indeed, this is the truth, that you do lead us, guide us, and strengthen us. Lord, we ask that today, through this worship service, that we can make space in our minds and our hearts for you. Know that we do not need to be anywhere else but here at this time. And Lord, as you call us from the busyness of our lives, allow us to take advantage of this moment to just be in your presence. Lord, allow us to hear from you through the prayers and the songs and the scriptures, through the messages that are proclaimed. Lord, teach us to be a people who are humble to listening and learning from you. God, allow us this time to just come to know you and love you as you know and love us. Lord, I thank you for this day, and I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you in worship today. We are so glad that you have chosen to be with us here in the sanctuary, as well as those who are worshiping with us online this morning. We are glad that you are all here to take part in this marvelous occasion of worship. This morning, our opening hymn is number 73. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing God's power and God's love. So let's sing of God's power and his love as we stand together. How tender, how firm 
confession of our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Good morning and work, welcome to worship. If you would please fill out your information on the Connect cards, which can be found in the pew pockets in front of you. Put your information on there, and if you have any prayer requests, uh, you may put those on there and turn those in with the offering. Uh, if you'll take a look at the screen in the back, you'll see uh, I'm very tan there. Look at that. Looks, my hair, hair still looks good, though. A uh, couple of announcements for you. If you'll look in your bulletin, you will see today at 12.15, right after this service, we have a meeting for Vacation Bible School volunteers. Come hear about our week and see where you can help. And we have 135 children signed up and 63 volunteers that are signed up. So it's going to be a great week and a full week. And uh, uh, so today at 12.15, we'll hear all about that. And then we have our garage sale August 12th through 13th. And again, we ask that you bring your stuff after Bible school is over. But when you bring it, please bring it pre-priced. That will greatly help those setting up the garage sale. And that will benefit the Hispanic ministry. Today, Cherie Cotner had a book signing during the Sunday school hour. Yeah, that's for the book she wrote. And I bet if you get her book, she will still sign it for you anytime. Cherie is faithful to our church, and we are, are very blessed to have her in our church. Those are all of the announcements that we have. I want to invite you to stand and welcome one another to worship, and I want to invite the children forward for their special time.
morning. Need to get my phone out for my sermon today. What kind of app is this that I have out here? What is this app? A compass app. That's right. It tells you which way is north, which way is south, east and west. I want you to try to point to which way you think north is. Which way do you think is north? We got all kinds of pointing. North is that way. Okay, so where would south be? That way, that's right. Okay, so you can use a compass. Let's say you're going on a hike and you get lost. You could use a compass to point you in the right direction if you knew what direction you needed to go. Otherwise, a compass would just tell you which way is which, and you wouldn't know which way you need to go. Well, when I was 21, which was about five years ago, <laughs> I went skydiving, and I had to land. This is Skydive Houston, which is, isn't even really close to Houston. It's in Waller. And I had to land right here in this grassy area next to the runway. But they said, do not land right here in the pond. They said, that would be bad. They said, do not land right here in the Rottweiler farm. That would be bad. Yes. Yes, that would be bad, wouldn't it? Because you would bust your head open. Yes, and then the dogs would come lick my wounds, I bet. <laughs> so I jumped out of the plane, and I had the two jump masters holding on to me. And when I pulled the cord, they let go, and I'm there all alone except for I had a radio on my chest so that a guy could tell me he could help guide me down. But at one point, he says, turn east, turn east. Well, you didn't give me a compass, so I don't know which way east is. And I couldn't tell him this because I couldn't talk to him through the radio. I could only hear him. So I start getting worried. I look at the sun. Which way is east? I don't know which way east is from looking at the sun. That does no good. I'm like looking for a big landmark. Maybe I can see New Orleans from here. That's east. You can't see New Orleans. So I had no clue. And finally he said, pull with your left hand. Thank you. I can do that. But telling me to go east when I had no which idea which way was east did me no good. So if you have a compass and it tells you which way is which, it doesn't do you any good unless you know which way you need to go. Well, God has given us a map, and this is it right here. The, it shows us the way to go, to follow his son, the way, the truth, and the life. It's the way we get to God. But he also gives us a spiritual compass, and that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that says, go this way. You need to get back on track. You need to get back on the path that's in the map, that's in the Bible. And if we are told something, but we don't know what's in here, we're going to be lost, just as lost as if we didn't have any map or compass or anything. So we've got to know the Bible. We've got to be reading it every day so that we know God's word and the way that he wants us to go. And my verse this week comes from John 16, verse 13, and it says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance. Help us when we get off track. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, before we uh, begin talking about congregational singing, I want to share with you that we are in for a real treat today for our offertory. Nala Mutre uh, graduated this uh, past May at Mumford High School, and I am really excited to share with you that she has been accepted to the music school at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches. She's been singing in the choir here. We've had such a great time with her, and, and I'm so proud of her. She's very talented, as you'll see in a moment. And I really worked real hard to try to talk her out of going to college and just staying here with us. But for some reason, she didn't like that idea. I don't know why. But uh, I'm so pleased that she's going to be singing. I know that you will be blessed 
by her today. On the front of your bulletin is part of today's scripture that happens a lot, uh, not just uh, by osmosis, but I try to find those things that, that remind us of what scripture will be a par a part of the service each Sunday. But this particular week, how can we thank God enough for all the joy we have from First Thessalonians? Even though life can sometimes be incredibly difficult, we all know that. God gives us so many wonderful reasons to have joy and happiness with the life that we are privileged to live. And today we're going to sing about that joy and that happiness as we sing together, His Eye is on the Sparrow, I've got peace like a river and joy like a fountain, and joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Will you stand and let's sing together. <laughs>
call the church to prayer. You you already aware that our church has been called to prayer for discernment. We've been in a time, a season of prayer, and I continue to call you to pray every day. And on Wednesdays, we're meeting here at 6. I appreciate those of you that are coming. On our prayer list, you'll always see people to pray about, and I hope you'll put on your Connect card if there's something we can uh, join together and pray for. Um, last evening, Jim Smith died and went to be with the Lord, and grateful that he's he's there. But Gene is hurting, so keep Gene in your prayers. And a couple of days before that, Mayor McDonald passed. I did her husband's funeral in April, so Tuesday I'm gonna going to Waco to do her service. Um, there's always there's always somebody here or somebody watching online that's in a journey of grief. So I hope you'll lift them up. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to come. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. You, Lord, watch us like a sparrow. Your eye is on us when we break a wing, when we're hurting. We are so grateful that you are God who cares. Your word says for us to cast all of our anxieties upon you because you care for us. So, Lord, we come. And part of our anxiousness is knowing there are people that are hurting on our prayer list, and we lift them up to you. Some of them need healing grace. Some of them need a job. Some of them need wisdom. And, Lord, we just lift them all up. We pray for Gene Smith and for the McDonald family for their journey of grief that started this week and we ask for your comfort and grace in their life and Lord we pray for our church and the discernment time we're in as a church along with over 200 churches in our conference that have already started and we pray for your wisdom and that you would find us faithful and obedient in all that we do Lord we give you thanks for the opportunity to worship you with giving to give like Jesus and so in this moment of worship we come to bring you an offering and with it our very heart to say we love you. Lord, help us now to pray the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those Slow to anger 
your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord of my soul oh my soul worship his holy name your holy name and on that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy today comes from 1st Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 1 through 10. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we decided to be left alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God in proclaiming the gospel for Christ and proclaiming the excuse me. And we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God in proclaiming the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith so that no one would be shaken by these persecutions. Indeed, you yourselves know this is what we are destined for. In fact, when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer persecution. So it turned out, as you know, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor had been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. He has told us also that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, just as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers and sisters, during all our distress and persecution, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. For we now live, if you continue to stand firm in the Lord, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Thanks, Pastor Jim. When uh, you look at this passage that Pastor Jennifer read, you notice there's repetition of two words five times. Whenever you see repetition like that, that should get your attention. Over and over, Paul says to the church, I'm talking to you about your faith, your faith in Jesus, your faith, not somebody else's, your faith. So today I thought I'd ta start the sermon off with a testimony from someone I don't know, but you you probably know him. I just learned this morning from Nick that Texas A&M University refused to give him a scholarship out of high school. University of Texas refused to give him a scholarship out of high school because he he had an injury, he had a in, messed up knee. But he went on to Purdue University, went on to be a Super Bowl winning quarterback, and I want you to know why. I want to share the testimony with you of Drew Brees. You go to Sunday school, um, you enjoy hearing the, the, the Bible stories, and then you go uh, to you know the big the big sermon, the big church, and you sit there and I'm just, you know. Me and my brother just kind of hitting each other, just wondering when it's going to get over. <laughs> the second to last game of the season, third round of the playoffs, um, I was the starting quarterback. Um, I suffered a torn ACL in my knee. It was devastating, devastating for me. Junior high school too, this was when you're supposed to get recruited and just all of these things. I had to wait to have surgery for a month because they had to let the MCL heal before they repaired the ACL and then I was still on crutches and it was just, I'd hit that point. I had seen friends have that injury and never come back quite the same. So what I thought was just gonna be my life, sports, I felt like was being stripped away from me. And I remember sitting in church on my 17th birthday and sitting in that same pew where my brother and I used to just goof around and never pay attention. And for some reason that day it was different and I was locked in um, on the pastor as he was sitting there talking about how the Lord was looking for a few good men to carry on his kingdom to spread his word and to live the life that, that he had planned for them and that spoke to me and it was at that moment that I accepted Jesus Christ in my heart and knew that there was something that was bigger planned for me than just sports fifth season going into an off season in which I did not have a contract I was gonna be a free agent I get hurt the very last game of the 2005 season with the San Diego Chargers I've never dislocated anything in my life but I knew exactly what happened and I knew too that besides maybe like a broken neck or something that that is the absolute worst injury that I could ever have asked for for a quarterback as I'm walking off the field with my shoulder stuck like this because it was dislocated, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm probably never going to put on a Charger uniform again. And then it hits me that, you know, I might not ever play football again. A few short months later, uh, my wife and I were taking a visit to uh, New Orleans, uh, who was six months post-Katrina, and we're just looking at the, the sheer devastation and just saying, I'm not gonna trust what I see with my eyes here because my eyes are telling me not to come here. <laughs> and yet my heart, my soul, the Lord is telling me that this is our calling. Uh, it's not about just coming to play football and be a part of the resurgence of a, a football team or an organization, but it's about the resurrection and rebirth of a city and we can be a part of that. score the Colts are driving we get the interception we go score now we're up 14 with three minutes left and yet you're still thinking I know Peyton Manning I know this this team in your mind you're going through all these scenarios of what you're gonna have to do still and then we get the ball back um, to basically take a knee to win the game and it wasn't until that moment that all right we are world champions We as, as people, do we want to see and touch and feel in order for it to be real for us? And yet, 2 Corinthians 5-7, I'll tell you, you'll be led by faith and not by sight. You know, so much of life is that. It's, it's faith in God, knowing that he's got a plan. And at times you don't understand it, and you're not going to see it. 
um, and yet you just have to trust and you have to have faith. Amen. We, we live by faith, not by sight. It's a powerful testimony of someone who's, who's had to face life's challenges, not knowing what his future held, but knowing that he was going to be able to trust God no matter what happened. And it was his faith at age 17 on his birthday, he came to faith. He received Christ. It wasn't his parents' faith anymore. It wasn't his friends. That's why Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica and says five times, your faith. It's got to be yours. You don't get it. You don't, you, you don't get to depend on somebody else's. It has to be your faith. You have to decide. And for us that are called to share our faith, we know that we don't, we don't live by sight. Instead, we, we walk by faith. And when we share our faith together, what are we sharing but Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 that says for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast that's the faith we share I've been preaching through first Thessalonians this summer and I'm focused on key words in each chapter and the key words in this chapter is your faith over and over and over your faith. Paul wrote to encourage them in the faith, to keep the faith, to defend the faith. I wonder today, do you understand that there's a difference between faith in Christ and every other kind of faith? If you notice, it's popular today to, to lump them all together. I hear, I hear um, this phrase, we're a, we're a community of faith. No, that would be putting faith in faith. We're a community of Christ. Faith in faith. A lot of people have that. An atheist has faith. He's got more faith than I do. An atheist believes there is no God. But that's faith in faith. Buddhists have faith that they're going to be reincarnated over and over and over. But that's faith in faith. Bible says that as Christians we don't put faith in faith we put it in a person the person of Christ as our Lord and Savior and when you put your faith in Christ then you can pray what the psalmist prayed my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth the secular world has a kind of faith it's sometimes called positive thinking I'd like to think positive you remember the children's book the little the little engine that could y'all remember that book it teaches us at a young age that if we just have positive thinking and think we can we can get up that hill how many people here got up every single hill yes you don't need to show your hands i know you don't get up every single hill that's why somebody wrote a cartoon the other day with a new title for the book I thought I could. I thought I could. Sometimes we don't make it. And if you've put your hope in what Drew Brees was talking about, the epitome of success as a professional, and, and if you do that, then you're putting faith in faith. But when you put your hope in Christ, then no matter what happens, you're still able to walk through it. I read a true story this week about a man who visited a priest. He was his priest. Walked in the office of the priest. The priest asked him what seems to be the trouble. The man began to weep. He was distraught. He was tired. You could see it. He began to tell the priest about his life. He said, Father, I've messed up made a giant mess of my life. 
man said, Father, I don't have any hope anymore. I've ruined my life. I don't have a chance anymore. I can't get it back. And the priest sat back in his chair, and with a smug grin on his face, he said, Have faith, my son. The person that told that story is the priest himself. And he told this story because he was ashamed of himself after he said it. The man that had come into his office sat on the edge of the chair straight up and said to his priest, I would have faith, Father, but I don't know what faith is. Tell me, what is faith? How do I get it? Why is it important? And the priest's smug look disappeared very quickly, and he writes that he realized he didn't have an answer. He didn't really have an answer. Here he was, a priest. His name is Father Naru. And the priest, because he didn't have an answer, started on a journey to find out the answer. What is faith? How do I get it? Why is it so important? In our Methodist heritage, somebody once asked John Wesley a similar question. It was a young preacher, and he said, I really don't have faith. What am I supposed to do to preach it? And here's what Wesley said, quote, preach faith till you have it, and then because you have it, you'll preach faith. What if you were the priest and someone asked you, what is faith? How do I get it? Why is it important? Well, the Bible tells us, so I'm going to share with you a very quick answer. If you took notes, you could give this answer, but i got to warn you, as I've said throughout the sermon already, it's got to be your faith, and it's got to be your answer, and you have to determine that for yourself. What is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 tells us, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What does that mean? Well, first it says assurance of things hoped for. When you say the word assurance, that conveys the idea that you have confidence and trust, not in faith, but in the Lord. Not in positive thinking, though that's important, but in the Lord. This is not confidence in yourself, but you need self-confidence, but that comes from the Lord. You trust God. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That means you're certain God is going to provide an answer in a way. Second part of this verse is it's a conviction of things not seen, and trust that they will happen. So when the assurances of God meet the conviction of your heart, then what is born there is faith. And when that faith meets the grace of God, you're born again. You're born anew. The Bible says you're justified by faith. Here's what Wesley said. Justifying faith implies not only a divine evidence or conviction that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself but a sure trust and confidence that Christ died for my sins that he loved me and gave himself for me then it becomes your faith have you ever had a moment in your life when it became your faith not somebody else's you're not saved by somebody else's faith. It's got to be yours. God has given you the assurance of things hoped for in his word, protection and security and peace and strength and rest, purpose and eternal life. There is no faith without conviction that the Lord is not just able to keep his promises, but that he will keep his promises. I am grateful for people in my life that remind me 
of that and remind me of what I preach. I believe that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The second thing that faith is, somebody were to ask you, what is it? Where does it come from? How would you answer? Where does faith come from? Faith itself is a gift from God, but it comes from a particular thing that you do. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Five times Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear. It seems that hearing is important, but what are we talking about? Just the ability to listen to something? No, we're talking about hearing that goes down deep in your soul so that you truly hear God speak. Faith is found when the Holy Spirit confirms the Word of God in you, and you believe it. Faith is a gift that grows from the knowledge of the truth of God's Word. That is how you obtain faith. It comes by hearing and believing the Word of God. Thirdly, lastly, why faith is important. How would you answer that? Why is faith important? Maybe when you came into church today, you're like that guy that went into his priest's office who didn't have an answer. He only had a platitude. But that priest knew that and went on a journey to be able to find real faith. Why is it important? St. Augustine said, it is the very limits of our reason that make faith necessary because you're never going to figure everything out. That's not going to happen. At some point, you've got to put faith in the Lord. That's why you need it. It's necessary. Nothing is ever accomplished without faith and works. That's why the Apostle James wrote, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Somebody else put that in a different way. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you do. Then I'll know if you really have faith. The Apostle Paul was writing the church in Thessalonica to encourage them in the faith, to defend the faith. I preach today to do the same thing, to bring before you what Paul is saying to you, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that your faith might increase and that you would trust God. And how do you do that? How do you take the first step? Martin Luther King Jr. said this about faith. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. What a great understanding of faith. It's taking the first step even when you can't see the top of the stairs, but you trust God is there want to end with an illustration I'm going to have to get away from the pulpit it's one of my favorite jokes you may, you may think I'm picking on Roman Catholics I am not I have great respect I have good friends but one day this nun who was working for a home health care agency she was going to go visit a patient and she ran out of gas. So she had to walk back a little ways, go to the gas station. She wanted one of those orange or red cans. You know the cans I'm talking about, put gas in? They didn't have it, they didn't have a can. So she remembered that there was something in her car that she uses sometimes when patients need them. So she opened her car, she got a bedpan. She went to the filling station and she filled up with a gallon and she had to walk back with this gallon of gas real carefully. She gets to her car, she starts pouring it in there and two guys came by and said, sister, that's what I call faith. <laughs> that's a great joke. I don't care who you are, that's a great joke. The problem with that joke is that's really not faith. That would be presumption that you can get a car started from something out of a bedpan. Real faith also means that you know that God works in real ways. And that's why James said, faith without works is dead. 
I preach here today with people that I've known for 12 years, and I know some of your personal stories. I know your faith. I could say what Paul said. I know your faith. I know you're trying to raise your children in the Lord. I know you are working at trying to make mobility worldwide everything that God called it to be, Ken. I know I could go around the sanctuary and tell you I know your faith. And the reason is, it is your faith. You've made it that because you have the faith to believe. But as I stand here today, I, I've got to tell you, I've had more of a conviction than ever before in my life, especially on Wednesday nights when we pray together. More of a conviction than ever that I need to make sure every Sunday that there's not a person here that I don't give the opportunity to accept Christ. I make that assumption way too much that I'm preaching to the choir. I wonder if there might be a person like Drew Brees in church his whole life. By the way, he's from Texas. 17 years of age on his birthday, he's in church, and for that moment, somehow, the Holy Spirit grabbed him, and he focused, and it changed his life. Do you know Christ? Can you say you have faith? Not somebody else. You. Do you know that he died for you? Do you know that he's risen from the dead? Do you know what it means to walk by faith and not by sight? I want to invite you to know him. And those of you that know him, I want to invite you to keep walking, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, and keep walking by faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the people who've helped us in our journey in life to understand the gospel that Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again. There may be a person here today that's going through a tough time like Drew Brees did or tough time that all of us experience. I lift them up and I pray they'd put their faith in you and if they never put their faith in you as Lord and Savior that they would do it in this moment this very second so that today would be the day of their salvation that they would ask you into their heart just like a 17 year old did just like many Lord come into that person forgive them of their sin help them to begin a personal relationship with you that is real and personal and life changing and for people my brothers and sisters that are here Lord that are challenged every day with tough things they don't know what the top of the step is going to look like. They're just taking it one step at a time. Lord, help them to keep taking that step, to keep walking by faith and not by sight. Lord, bless them. Whatever is going on in their life, to walk by faith, not by sight. This is our prayer, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 733. We're marching to Zion, beautiful Zion. We're marching to the city of God. Will you stand and let's sing together 733. Got to do something. Billy and Betty, I know you were planning to join the church. Where are you? I'm looking around. There you are. <laughs> Y'all are going to join. I want to meet you to do that. There may be other people inspired today to join the church. And if so, come and join Billy and Betty as we sing this song.
Bill or Billy and Betty uh, Horn, and they're here today to unite with our church. They're transferring their membership from First United Methodist Church in Houston, where they lived, and they've moved up here. We are so grateful that y'all are chosen to be part of our church family. So uh, standing behind you is your daughter, and you said this is your better half. Mm, I think y'all are probably good halves, so I'm grateful that y'all came up here today. Uh, Billy and Betty, would you support First United Methodist Church, Brian, with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Mm -hmm. Welcome to this church family. We're glad to have you. <laughs> Amen. So I'm going to ask you to remain here, and those of you that will come and welcome them as new members, you come this way and then go, go out whichever direction y'all want to go. But the, I'm going to ask them to just stay right where they're at. And Pastor Jim, can you say the benediction, please? <laughs> 